Welcome everyone. We are so happy that you are here for our event today, Ready and Able to Work and Save, a two-part online event. I will go over a few logistics. My name is Cheyenne. I am the project coordinator for ABLE National Resource Center. Listening to the webinar today, the audio for today's meeting can be accessed using computer audio or by calling in by phone. If you select computer audio, please make sure your speakers are turned on or your headphones are plugged in. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or prefer to listen by phone, dial one 205 The webinar ID is 817-1287-4178. Captioning. Real-time captioning is provided during this webinar. The captions can be found by clicking on the closed captions icon in your Zoom controls at the bottom of the screen. If you do not see the captions after clicking the button, please alert the host via the chat box. Questions. For today's event, we will have the Q&A and chat box closed during this webinar. Join us on Thursday, October 19th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for part two of Ready and Able to Work and Save. This is, of course, our two-part online event. We're offering a technical assistance office hour on Thursday on ABLE accounts and employment. This is an opportunity for employers and service providers who participated today in the part one of the series to ask questions of our featured guests, panelists, ABLE subject matter, matter experts, and work incentive counselors. Register for part two. I will place the link in the chat window today as well. Technical assistance. If you experience technical difficulties, please email info at ablenrc.org and in the subject line, press webinar help. Please note this webinar is being recorded and the materials will be placed on the ABLE National Resource Center website along with all other ABLE webinars. So with that, introducing Tom Foley, Executive Director of the National Disability Institute. Oh, thanks so much, Cheyenne. And thank you to everyone for being here today. Super excited. Uh, to talk about ABLE accounts, but um, as Cheyenne said, thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, I wanted to give a, just a little bit of quick background on NDI for those of you who may not be familiar with us, but we're the first and only national disability organization that works exclusively on issues of economic and financial inclusion for folks with disabilities. Uh, we are also a disability-led organization. Um, I'm the executive director. I'm also totally blind. And so um, just a heads up, you may hear a little bit of JAWS in the background from time to time, because um, if you're familiar with it, you know JAWS always likes to get its attention as well. Carol, let's go to the next slide. Um, but today, um, the National Disability Institute, uh, we're, we're bringing forth our ABLE National Resource Center. So I'm here representing our ABLE National Resource Center. Um, ABLE NRC is the leading comprehensive objective source of information about state ABLE programs and providing guidance about um, tax advantaged uh, ABLE accounts, 529 accounts. Our mission is to educate and promote and support the positive impact that ABLE can have. Um, as a person with a disability who's been on benefits in the past, really excited to talk more about what ABLE can do um, for people with disabilities uh, to build a better economic and financial future. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I would be remiss without mentioning that October is National uh, Disability Employment Month. Um, really excited to be able to bring this presentation to you today. So can we go to the next slide? So today, the ABLE National Resource Center um, and Access are brought, whoops, are, um, and there's JAWS, 
um, are joining uh, with Ability One to bring um, ready and able to work and save in honor of National Disability Employment Month. So obviously today is the first in the two part series. And as Cheyenne mentioned earlier, uh, the second part an office hour where we can answer any questions you may have of either the MDI staff or of the staff uh, or of any of our, um, our guests today. Um, but you know, in honor of National Disability and Employment Month, I did want okay. to um, just sort of take a pause here because earlier, Early on in the week, I was on a, a call with the Department of Labor, and um, you know somebody was telling me that there were 500 different registrants for today. So one of the, when when I was talking with Department of Labor, they were saying that um, we are at the highest level of disability employment in the history of this country. The workforce participation rate for folks with disabilities is as high as it's ever been. So I, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who's here today and congratulations. Um, that is quite an accomplishment. And it doesn't matter if you've been doing this work for 30 days or if you've been doing this work um, for 30 years. I, I just wanna say thank you. And thank you for choosing to be part of the solution, um, building an employment and a financial future for folks with disabilities. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And speaking of employment and building a future for people with disabilities, our guest speakers today, um, our, our first guest speaker today from the Ability One is Kim Zyke. Uh, Kim, over to you. Thank you so much, Tom. And hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to join with the ABLE National Resource Center and Access to take part in this webinar. Again, I'm Kim Zyke. I'm the Executive Director of the U.S. Ability One Commission. And the Ability One Commission is an independent federal agency. Our seal and logo are on my, my background here. Um, we oversee the Ability One program. And the Ability One program creates and sustains jobs for people who are blind and people with significant disabilities. And we do that in the performance of federal contract work. In the Ability One program, we have about 430 employers nationwide. They are often referred to as social enterprises. Um, and they are a traditional partner. They're a logical partner um, to work with us to promote ABLE accounts um, because they employ individuals with disabilities, including many, many people who are eligible for ABLE accounts. And in the Ability One program, we're really emphasizing what we call good and optimal jobs. And those include competitive wages and benefits. Those include job individualization and customization and career advancement planning. So as we work to increase wages, it's really important that we talk about benefits. And we see ABLE accounts as an excellent tool in that area. ABLE accounts can be leveraged by eligible employees to save and to accumulate assets without jeopardizing benefits. We're working to spread the word across the Ability One network and beyond through national conferences, through webinars like this one, through radio and digital media, whenever we have the opportunity. We do a lot of work in the federal space in the Ability One program. So I've been fortunate to be able to talk about ABLE accounts a little bit on Federal News Network, for example. And I just really want to thank um, NDI, the National, uh, the ABLE National Resource Center, certainly Tom, uh, Miranda, everyone on the team. I also want to thank Kate McSweeney, Sarah, and everyone at Access for their work in planning this webinar. And in advance, I'll uh, thank our panelists who are speaking today. Uh, we have representatives from an Ability One employer. They'll be sharing their practical experience. So I'm really looking forward to hearing all about that. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Kate McSweeney with Access. Kate, over to you. Thank you, Kim. It's so nice to be here today. I, I just want to um, emphasize what Kim said in relation to what a real privilege this has been to work with NDI and the ABLE National Resource Center with Miranda Kennedy and Tom and the whole team at NBI, NDI. And with Kim, 
on on this webinar we've been meeting regularly over the last six months it has been a, an adventure um it has been a friendship forming uh opportunity and i have learned a lot about able accounts i first learned of able accounts in 2016 when i joined access and attended the access virginia conference or the, i'm sorry the virginia access conference in september of that year and i came away with a lot of questions and i have been able to actually learn so much just in the planning of this but i'm still going to take notes today because this is a really important program and an opportunity and the mission, our collective mission, was really to get the word out and to answer a lot of the questions people have or clear up any misconceptions. Access is a national advocacy organization. We uh, we work with provider, disability service providers from around the country. I want to thank Ken Crum, who is with us today, with Service Source, one of our members, uh, an Ability One um, social enterprise, and um, also a good friend. And with that, I'm going to send it back to Cheyenne so she can get the webinar started. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, uh, today's other panelists include Ken Crum, Chief Operating Officer with Service Source. As a Service Source employee for more than two decades, Ken has diverse expertise in both management of large operational programs and community rehabilitation services. Over the years, he has been involved in many elements of service source programs, including day and employment services, overseeing complex Ability One contracts and senior executive leadership. He has shown proven success in building innovative programs and creative partnerships to advance the mission of community-based services to change the lives of program participants, their families, and ultimately the communities in which they live. So welcome, Ken. And we have Missy Crawford Smith. Missy is a program manager with Service Source and is certified as a community partner, work incentives counselor. Missy has worked with Service Source for over 15 years. As an experienced work incentive counselor, she is providing individualized counseling information about work and benefits. Missy assists individuals with disabilities to obtain self-sufficiency and financial independence through work incentive counseling. I'm passing it back on to you, Tom, and I went to the next slide. Thanks, Cheyenne. Um, okay, <laughs> terrific, sorry, thanks. Um, so welcome, um, uh, welcome again, welcome to Ready and Able to Save. So again, this is a two-part event of today and Thursday. And, um, you know, today we're going to talk about um, ABLE accounts and then really look forward to talking with uh, Ken and Missy a little bit later. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So um, today's presentation, we're going to introduce tax advantaged ABLE accounts and resources, and hopefully answer some questions um, that we normally get when we start talking about ABLE accounts. We're going to answer, you know, what are ABLE accounts, who is eligible for them, why they are so important, and how they are opened, managed, fund, and used. And then we're going to sort of wrap up by providing uh, resources for both employers and service providers to, um, to be able to help them to integrate ABLE accounts into their offerings. Let's go to the next slide. So ABLE accounts, here we go, next slide. ABLE legislation and financial independence. So I will never forget this day in December of 2014 um, when President Obama signed, uh, signed um, able accounts into law. Uh, I often tell the story, I was with a different disability organization at the time, but the two, two and a half years previous to this, I remember you know, running from one meeting um, on the Hill to another meeting at the Hill and uh, INNDI staff and lots of other disability advocates um, would just sort of cross each other in the hall. And again, I think this is a great time to say thank you. I know a number of people on this webinar and a number of people participating in this webinar 
um, you know, from activists to advocates to um, employers did a lot of work to get ABLE across the finish line. Um, so thank you for that. But what ABLE accounts do is allow a state to create special tax advantage savings accounts for people with disabilities. This allows many people with disabilities, sometimes for the first time ever, to save more than $2,000 um, and not and, and maintain their eligibility for needs-based benefits. You know, I mentioned I had been on SSI, and I'll, I'll never forget um, uh, back when I was in college in 19-something, um, the one thing I had always wanted to do was buy a house. And this is long before ABLE accounts. And I remember, you know, I was, I, I was on SSI, and I was working part-time, and just about every dollar I saved, I saved for a down payment for a house. And, um, you know, I remember I, about a year and a half later, you know, going to the bank, uh, it, was, it was in February, it was dark, and I was, you know, crossing the, the, the mean streets of Berkeley, California, with um, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in cash, because there was no other way that I could save money for a down payment. And fortunately, now, thanks to ABLE accounts, uh, people don't have to do that. So this is, ABLE accounts, um, uh, I'm the guy you never want to be caught next to at a cocktail party. I'll talk to you about able accounts until the cows come home. But a super exciting opportunity for people with disabilities, again, sometimes to save uh, safely for the first time ever. Let's go to the next slide. So what is an able account? There's a lot here, and the following slides will break it down. So what an able account allows is for a person with a qualifying disability that begins prior to their 26th birthday, they can open a tax advantage 529 ABLE account in their own name, and it allows them to save and invest money. Um, it could be their money, it could be employment money, it could be money from family and friends, um, and uh, it could be income tax, it could be benefits, um, you know, any cash. Use those funds to pay for a wide variety of disability-related expenses, and maintain those hard-won disability benefits. One note to this, you might notice I said, um, you know, with the disability prior to age 26. Uh, it, last December, a piece of legislation uh, was passed called um, the ABLE Age Adjustment Act. So starting in January of 2026, the eligibility will expand to people with a disability onset, onset before age 46. So let's go to the next slide. So who is ABLE eligible? So these tax advantaged ABLE savings or investment accounts are owned by a person with a social security number or tax ID number who has a disability or is blind um, and that those, uh, the blindness or the disability began before age 26. Um, two, two things I, I uh, want to point out here. Um, the, in addition to having a disability, um, if you receive supplemental Social Security um, or Social Security disability income, that is also dispositive of uh, having a disability. So really, there, you can either be somebody who is receiving these benefits or, and this is really important, um, that you have a written and signed certification from a doctor. And um, um, so, so the, the thing I want to point out here is some, one of the things I hear quite often from people in the community is, oh, I don't receive benefits, so um, I'm not eligible for an ABLE account. You don't need to be receiving any benefits to uh, open an ABLE account. You just have to have disability onset you know, before age 26. Um, and be uh, therefore be eligible and have uh, the letter from a doctor or self-certified. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about a lot today is also our ABLE decision guides. So again, I'm here representing ABLE uh, National Resource Center today or ablenrc.org. We have a series of ABLE decision guides that really help take people through many of the um, decision uh, pieces of opening an ABLE account. And so am I ABLE eligible is one of the decision guides you can, guides you can see at ABLE NRC. Let's go to the next slide. 
So continuing um, who can open an ABLE account. Here's another piece of information that people always um, are confused by. So we, we said that the disability onset needs to be before age 26. But you can, if that is true for you, you can open an account at any point. You could open at 20, 30, 50, 60 years old, doesn't matter. Um, so as long as the disability onset is before age 26, you can open an account at any point. Um, you can only have one ABLE account, um, and they tend to be opened um, uh, in this order by the individual with the disability, by someone the person with the disability selects, uh, could be an agent under a power of attorney or some sort of legal guardian, spouse, parent, grandparent could open one as well, and even a representative payee um, can or organization can open it. Um, again, here is a really handy decision guide available through ablenrc.org. Uh, selecting and opening an ABLE account can, will help take people through um, that whole decision matrix. So why are, what's, uh, sorry, next slide. Why are ABLE accounts so important? So um, given uh, what most of us do for a living that are on this webinar, this will come as no surprise, but there are extra costs that come with living with a disability. Um, <clears throat> we did some research here at NDI a couple of years ago, and on average, people with disabilities spend about 29% more income um, than their non-disabled peers to reach the same level of, um, of independence as, as their non-disabled peers. So um, given the medium household income today, that's more than $18,000. Um, so obviously people with disabilities have additional expenses. It could be a personal assistant. It could be the cost of a guide dog. It could be a modified van. It could be something as simple as living closer to, um, to your place of work where it might be more expensive to rent or own. Um, so people with disabilities uh, you know, run into uh, higher levels of expense. And so an ABLE account is something that can really help, um, uh, help offset some of these expenses. Let's go to the next slide. So why are uh, ABLE accounts important? So you can save up to $100,000 in an ABLE account, and those dollars will be disregarded as a resource for purposes of SSI. So let me say that again. You can save up to $100,000 in an ABLE account, and they will not be counted as a resource for purposes of SSI. But even more importantly than that, depending on the program, remember these are state-based programs, so the, some of these numbers differ a little bit, but anywhere between 235 and 550,000, depending on the state program, um, uh, you don't have to worry about any uh, benefit effect for SSDI, housing assistance or uh, related to HUD, Supplemental nutritious, Nutrition Assistance, or SNAP, free application, uh, FAFSA, the free FAFSA, Medicare A, B, C, and D, or any type of Medicaid benefit, including waiver services. So that was a lot. But again, we have the handy dandy um, um, decision guide uh, about ABLE and public benefits that you can check out at ablenrc.org. So third, next slide, why are ABLE accounts important? The um, ABLE accounts are also tax advantaged. So the money that you put into an ABLE account are post-tax dollars. And the, the, the money can accumulate interest um, or um, so the principal and interest can be invested, and the, uh, any earnings on uh, those dollars is used uh, will be considered tax-free <clears throat> as long as they're used for uh, disability-related expenses. You can uh, withdraw money from an ABLE account uh, and these investments at any time without penalty as long as you're using them for disability-related expenses. This part is really cool you can um, receive contributions into the account from family, friends, special needs trust, pooled trust. You can roll over money from a 529 college savings account. 
Um, uh, it is a great retirement vehicle. And for those of you uh, who know a little bit about retirement planning, this basically operates like a Roth. So the money that you put into it are, use, are after tax dollars. The money accumulates tax free. And as long as you use uh, the funds for uh, disability related expenses, um, those dollars uh, re you know, remain tax free. Let's go to the next slide. So who offers ABLE accounts? So uh, much like 529 college savings accounts, these are offered by states. And right now they are offered in 45 different states. Um, and uh, from, so you can or open a, an account in those 45 states. If you're uh, ABLE eligible, you can open an ABLE account in any state that accepts outside residents. So I'm here in Washington, D.C., so if I wanted to open up a California ABLE account, I could do that because California accepts outside, um, outside residents. Um, again, on the ABLE NRC website, we have a number of ABLE program comparison tools. So you can compare uh, up to three, um, three different programs at the same time. Um, across a number of different variables, you even get to pick which variables are most important to you. Maybe it's investment options. Maybe you want something in your own state that might even have an extra state benefit to you. Um, but lots of opportunities on ablenrc.org to be able to compare ABLE accounts and find the one that works best for you and your family. So let's go to the next slide. How do you open an ABLE account? So most accounts are opened online. Um, again, uh, because these are set up by the state and usually run through the state treasurer's office, uh, you can go through them online. That being said, if alternatives are needed, you can contact uh, individual um, ABLE accounts uh, for alternatives if needed. Um, once the account is open, the person with the disability can uh, allow other people to have basically varying levels of um, access to the account. Um, you could have people um, uh, authorized to take certain actions on, on the account. And, and again, for, for more information on this, we have a decision guide called Selecting and Opening an ABLE Account, um, another one called Managing Your ABLE Account, and you can find those at ablenrc.org. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, let's go to the next slide and get down to the nitty gritty. So how do you fund an ABLE account? Well, first of all, um, you can put up to $17,000 a year into an ABLE account. Um, uh, and it can be contributed by the person with a disability or their friends, their family. Again, a special needs or pooled trust, 529 account rollover. Um, and you know, if if we think of, I mean, that's a uh, seventeen thousand. That seventeen thousand dollars is also tied to the gift, uh, the the gift tax amount. So whenever you hear about the gift tax amount going up, so too will the annual contribution uh, to able accounts. But for those pe people with disabilities who have uh, an able account and are not partic and are working and are not participating in an employer sponsored retirement plan they can contribute additional dollars. So in general, in the continental US, um, that's about $13,500 in addition. Um, Alaska and Hawaii have slightly different numbers because of the cost of living there. Uh, Alaska, over 16,000, and Hawaii, um, 15,600. So that's just, just taking a step back from that, that would allow you know, a person with a disability who's working to contribute uh, up more than $13,000 a year, um, have that money grow, uh, $30,000 a year, have that money grow tax-free um, you know, to build uh, for um, you know, a better financial and economic future. Uh, we have a decision guide that talks a lot more about this as well, uh, finding funds to contribute to your ABLE account. Lots of interesting um, opportunities in there. Everything from you know employment dollars to family to crowdfunding to even uh, filing for the earned income tax credit. Um, it's a, it's a one of my favorite guides. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, 
we're putting money into our ABLE account. It's um, hopefully gaining some interest and growing over time. What can you save for or purchase? So this gets a little technical, but um, but don't don't worry. It's it, it's not as technical as it first seems. So uh, um, what can you save for? So ABLE funds can be used to pay for items or services that um, are related to an individual's uh, beneficiaries um, blindness or disability or for the benefit of that person with a disability and then check out this next line right maintain uh, maintaining to um, improving his health independence or quality of life so these are uh, the qualified disability um, expenses so this is, uh, we're going to talk about a list in a minute, but according to uh, the regulations, this is something that should be broadly understood and not limited to, you know, just something that is medically necessity, a medical necessity, um, or something that doesn't provide a benefit to other people. So again, anything that includes uh, quality of life or for the benefit of the beneficiary um, improves health. Uh, independence or quality of life. And again, very broadly interpreted um, there. And um, one, of the, one of the examples that I'd like to, to have is, you know, even if someone else uh, receives a benefit from it, um, you know, if I buy a car because it's easier to get around and my wife wants to use the car every once in a while, autonomous car, of course, don't be afraid, um, you know, th that would be a permissible expense. Let's go to the next slide. Other things that you can save for. So um, enumerated in the statute are education, basic expenses, including food and shelter. Uh, that could be um, you know, anything related to food or shelter. Housing, transportation, um, uh, rent, utilities, purchase of a home, property taxes, transportation, employment, training, and support, as anything sort of related to assistive technology, personal support services, and healthcare services, um, legal fees, funeral. And again, we have a handy dandy decision guide um, that allows you to determine whether or not something is gonna be a qualified disability related expense. So that is very much just a partial list. And again, um, we have the guidance that the statute should be interpreted broadly. Um, and so, you know, lots of things, uh, you know, can fall under a disability related, uh, qualified disability related expense. So let's go to the next side. Additional reasons to save uh, an enable account. So enable account would allow someone to spend down because um, uh, able deposits could uh, reduce countable resources for SSI or Medicaid eligibility. Um, there's also no look back for uh, contributions made to ABLE for uh, purposes of Medicaid eligibility as well. Um, and then lastly, you know, not only is this a great way for people to, uh, you know, uh, uh, save for the future and buy assets, you know, the an accessible van or uh, home ownership, something like that, but also to have, um, you know, emergency um, to provide for emergencies. We know so, from some of our data, uh, data, particularly in California, that a lot of people with disabilities, in the event of a natural disaster, don't have financial resources that they can fall back on when they really need it. So able accounts really can cover, um, you know, a wide variety of expenses and um, and needs for folks with disabilities. Um, in addition, it can provide other supports and services, uh, basically, you know, anything related uh, to the person's uh, quality of life, um, you know. Um, so, um, again, personally, just a huge fan of ABLE accounts, uh, particularly bringing them into the work environment. And so I want to invite Ken uh, to join us. Let's go to the next slide. Let's hear from our panel. So Ken, welcome, and we really appreciate you being here today, and um, and welcome. All right, well, thank you, Tom. Excellent. Great to have you here. So, yeah, it's you great know, to be here. 
Thank you. Uh, we appreciate it. So as the, the Chief Operating Officer of Servicer, can you share a little bit more about your organization and its mission, you know, for those who aren't really familiar and kind of highlight, you know, your um, intersection at service um, at, between, you know, service and employment? Sure. Yeah. And before I do that, you know, I just want to um, first give thanks and for the invite here to be able to participate. And Tom, we, we certainly share your passion around ABLE accounts. In fact, I'm going to seek you out at that cocktail party and we'll, I'm sure we'll have some really <laughs> robust discussions on ABLE um, and, and really want to thank, thank your whole team at NDI and the ABLE National Resource Center for all their supports over the years as we've built you know, really a book of, of information that we share with folks that we serve to educate and promote ABLE accounts. Um, also want to thank Kim and Kate for joining today and for their longstanding support of ABLE accounts, as, as I, I truly believe that they're a powerful tool uh, to support the individuals we serve. So, uh, you know, in terms of a, a brief overview of Service Source, we, we actually are a family of seven nonprofit agencies that have a mission of providing services and resources to people with disabilities and others that we serve in the community. Uh, as part of this, we provide a whole range of services uh, based on community needs. So this includes direct employment, job development and placement supports, uh, youth employment programs, supports to veterans, services to older adults, housing programs, and many other specialized services based on community need. Uh, last year in total, we collectively supported over 32,000 people across our offices, uh, which are located in Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, Delaware, and Utah. And then we provide employment programs in many more states across the country. Uh, much of what we do is anchored in employment, uh, both through the Federal Ability One program and by working with other community employers to help individuals achieve job outcomes and success. And so, you know, given all that, you asked, you know, what makes Service Source unique? And I think it's not only in our wide range of services, but also our commitment to providing the full range of supports to help individuals thrive and be successful in the community. You know, as part of this, we've had a long-standing commitment and ability to provide what I see as very sophisticated benefits counseling, uh, whether the person is an employee of ours or not. Uh, we've committed and have many certified work incentive counselors, also known as CWICs, uh, on our team. In fact, Missy, who's also here on the panel and joining me, uh, is one of those. And then we've also been providing work incentive planning and assistance services, sometimes known as WIPA, uh, through Social Security Administration grants in multiple states in which we operate. So very well versed uh, both in financial planning and assistance, but then we also support people that we serve with other services that are, uh, that are also common barriers. So such as transportation, housing, uh, peer supports, training, and really anything else that, that really could be categorized as a holistic need. So I'd say that in, in terms of the service source model, I think we really stand out and it's one that's focused on supporting all of the components to help someone be successful, both in the workplace and in the community. That's great. And we really appreciate what you do for so many folks with disabilities. You know, you mentioned the services and the benefits planning and the WIPA. How, how did ABLE accounts um, get onto your radar? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, we've, we've really had a long-standing relationship with NDI and uh, worked very closely with your predecessor, Michael Morris, really since the late 90s. Um, we've partnered with NDI on a number of programs to include financial empowerment, and various training programs over the years. And um, I'd say that Michael really helped introduce us to, you know, the Achieving a Better Life Experience Act, right, or ABLE, and the impact uh, at that time that we thought it would have on employees and the people we serve. And so we started tracking on it back in 2014 and uh, tracked it through legislative advocacy work and we're thrilled when, when Congress did pass that ABLE Act. Um, at that point, uh, we then engaged with, with your team at NDI to help train our team of benefits counselors to support what we see as a tool. Um, so we helped develop resources and immediately incorporated ABLE into those discussions as we were going through benefits counseling with people and families that we were serving, as well as try to create more formal avenues for spreading the word about ABLE accounts, such as you know benefits counseling and, and webinars and these types of things. So 
I guess the short answer is, uh, as soon as Congress passed ABLE back in 2014, uh, we tried to help start spreading the word on what we see as tremendous benefits and helping to connect people on how to establish and, and leverage these ABLE accounts as tools for savings. Absolutely. And then kind of a related question. Can you talk a little bit about how, you know, you and other leadership at ServiceSource, you know, saw a, a fit of ABLE accounts with your mission? Yeah, I think, um, you know, being an employer, that was pretty easy, right? There's a clear connection between the people we serve each day and um, the employment outcomes. And ABLE accounts being used as such a tool to encourage saving and promoting self-sufficiency while maintaining quality of life. So specifically on quality of life, when, you, when, when you, you're supporting an individual that may also be receiving Medicaid or Medicaid waiver or SSI, as, mm -hmm. as you mentioned in sharing your own experience, there's resource limits that come into play. Yep. And so by leveraging those ABLE accounts, it helps provide the opportunity to save while also maintaining those important benefits and the assistance that they very much need. And so, um, you know, we saw and continue to see ABLE accounts as a powerful tool to help expand uh, the mm -hmm. supports for our employees as well as others that we're serving in the community. Um, see this really as an innovative way to enhance services you know, positively impacting quality of life and also financial well-being. And so we were excited about the opportunities that ABLE accounts presented to encourage individuals with disabilities to save for their future goals and provide for current needs. So overall, you know, I see ABLE accounts as, as something that's very important and that, you know, as, if, as we educate folks, those individuals and families, they also see how it can help support, you know, the people we're serving to work without impacting the supports and services that are so essential for their well-being. So, you know, holistically, I think it's, it's, it's quite a tool. Yeah. Um, the limits are quite high that allow for savings. It's, it's not the full answer. I mean, I, I, there's still lots of work to be done in advocacy. I know, uh, you know, Kate and at the whole access team is tracking on, you know, earnings limits and how we can still continue to improve the system of social security benefits to help support working while also receiving those benefits that are much needed. But I do think that ABLE accounts are, are, are one leg of the stool that help provide supports for the individuals we're serving. You know, employment, savings, and obviously, you know, working to, to, to raise those caps around, um, around earnings. Sure. Um, no, you know, that makes total sense. So, so can you share, you talked about this a little bit, but can you share a little bit more about, you know, how you first, you know, get, got more info about ABLE and how you've um, sort of shared that information uh, across your organization? Yeah, yeah. So I mentioned NDI and I do think that, you know, much of the success that I've seen us have in helping to promote the use of ABLE accounts has really been in partnership with NDI um, and the ABLE Resource Center. And so through this partnership and the resources that you all have available, um, you know, I think we've really been able to educate folks on ABLE and leverage some of the collateral. You mentioned your websites and the videos. I know this webinar is going to be posted there. A lot of that is so helpful when you're working with an individual or a family, and Missy will, will expand more on this, yeah. but it, it's, it's how you educate and how you help folks see the benefit. Um, one of the things that we've done, for example, is our human resources team. You know, as we're onboarding new employees, uh, we often refer folks who may, we, we, we identify that may benefit from ABLE accounts over to our benefit counseling team and our internal counselors to help screen for eligibility and provide that information on ABLE accounts so that they know what the options are that may be able to help support them for savings. So it becomes part of that onboarding process. So again, you know, I mentioned earlier, this holistic view of supporting your employees. And this becomes one of the tools, um, you know, along with retirement savings, yep. which I do think it's somewhat of a balancing act. I mean, we have a strong commitment at Service Source to helping support our employees with savings for retirement. And you know, we've incorporated various processes for encouraging retirement savings, such as, you know, uh, you know an automatic enrollment unless you opt out. Uh, to start contributing to those accounts, and then for, for managing savings and maintaining benefits. Um, and so I expect Missy will share more about the particulars of this, but, but it is something that, you know, our counselors are very well versed in, 
And it's part of that discussion uh, that we have with, with folks when we're working with them on that decision-making process. You know, I'll also share that we've, we've created internal resources such as flyers with ABLE information that we share with people. Uh, we're promoting the benefits of ABLE accounts at, at town hall meetings and webinars that we have with through our operational programs, both on Ability One contracts, as well as we're supporting individuals out in the work environment with other employers, you know, all with the goal of helping outline and answer questions that they may have. Um, we also leverage our team of rehabilitation staff that are supporting the people we serve, and uh, they refer many of our Ability One employees to benefits counselors through, through our Ticket to Work program uh, to also help answer questions and address benefits concerns that they may have. And, and ABLE accounts are often part of that discussion to help open opportunities for people to save for current needs and future goals, rather than having to, and you mentioned this, spend down savings uh, to main benefit, maintain benefits essential for self-sufficiency and quality of life. So I think it's really all about supporting the people we serve uh, in that holistic way, creating um, you know, in, opportunities for information to be shared through materials and other platforms while also leveraging uh, benefits counseling support. So I think we've had some good success in sharing the information, I, I'd like to think. And uh, it, it's really a way that helps promote the benefits of ABLE accounts to the people we serve. No, I love that. And, you know, one of the things, uh, even putting disability aside, that we hear from employers all the time is, um, the focus on really supporting um, employees and supporting staff around better making better financial decisions, saving for retirement, all the things you mentioned. I love uh, the three percent match. I mean, who doesn't love free money when you're saving for retirement, right? Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, um, gosh, you mentioned so much. Um, what sort of able related um, outcomes are you seeing at this point, or or do you hope for? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think quite simply, we're seeing growth in ABLE accounts, um, which is a good thing, right? I mean, we, we've talked about all of these benefits and employees and others we serve are opening accounts. Um, our support team is recognizing the benefits of ABLE accounts and making those referrals when we recognize that there may be employees who would benefit from the ABLE account. Uh, we've supported and referred uh, close to 200 employees to ABLE accounts. And so, you know, what excites me about our outcomes, I think, is that we're seeing the benefits of our education efforts, right? So that not only with the individuals and families we serve, but also within our teams to be able to identify and help provide those supports to, to, to prevent folks from losing eligibility for, for the programs they need, whether it's Medicaid, the Medicaid waiver, or SSI. Um, we're also seeing outcomes on collaboration. Uh, around ABLE. For example, in Virginia, uh, we've been working with vocational rehabilitation staff to cross promote the Virginia ABLE program, which is really a, a very powerful program. When you look at the 45 states, I, that, that, was, it, that was news to me. I didn't know that 45 states now have programs, which is really great to hear. Yep. But um, through a platform that, that the state VR has called Good News Cafe, the VR staff can help get connected to help individuals set up and fund resources into their accounts while also providing financial empowerment training. So it's really in partnership with state VR uh, to help educate on ABLE accounts for people that we're, we're mutually serving. Uh, in North Carolina, uh, we're actually part of a benefits counseling expansion project nice. where service source is providing benefits counseling training, which is really a, a train the trainer type arrangement and providing ongoing support to staff of other nonprofit agencies at no cost. And so those trainings are provided by one of our experienced CWICs and the ABLE accounts are part of this training. So we're really seeing some good outcomes in partnering and promoting state resources and programs. I think also um, we're very excited about the ABLE Age Adjustment Act that Congress approved last December, uh, which expands eligibility. Uh, for ABLE accounts to an estimated 6 million more Americans, which includes a million veterans by raising the age limit uh, for onset of a disability from 26 to 46 starting in, in 2026. So still a little ways out, but I expect it'll fully, uh, it, it will fully increase the impact of ABLE, right? Yep. Enabling more people with disabilities to take advantage of these accounts. So really excited about the progress that's been made since 2014. And, um, 
you know, really what I see is successful efforts to promote and expand use of these benefits uh, through the ABLE accounts. That's great. Thanks, Ken. And thanks for all you do for folks with disabilities um, and employment. Um, Missy, let's, let's shift over to you. Um, can you share a little bit of an overview of the services that you provide and you know some of the jobs that folks have acquired through Service Source? Yes, hello. Um, my name's Missy. I work with Service Source. Um, I wear a lot of hats at Service Source, um, and benefit counseling falls into a lot of different areas. So I am a certified community partner work incentive coordinator, and I do benefit counseling for our employees. Uh, participants, families. Um, I work a little bit on the North Carolina program <laughs> where we're training uh, other agencies and also in the ticket to work programs. Um, so uh, counseling, benefits counseling really just consists of helping um, people understand how work may impact benefits and discussing work incentives, which are really just special work rules that have been created um, that people can take advantage of I work with a lot of people. So um, people can come with almost any job. Um, a lot of our employees that we employ are gonna be um, more in that ability one that was in, uh, mentioned earlier. So like general clerks, general maintenance, food service workers, janitors, we have contract closeout, um, help desk, customer service. Um, but really it could be any job um, out there someone could uh, if they have the qualifications, get and, and come and ask about how it looks with benefits. Great. And um, and thank you for, for that. So I'm, I'm curious, with, with all the different hats that you wear, um, can you talk a little bit about how ABLE accounts, you know, sort of fit in into your work and, you know, how, how you sort of message that to employees that might be eligible for an ABLE account? Sure. Um, so I've been with Service Source for 15 years, been doing the benefit counseling piece for 13 years, um, which seems like a lifetime at this point. <laughs> and as a benefit counselor, I get referrals um, from a lot of places. So um, from Voc Rehab, Vocational Rehab, um, Medicaid Waiver, I can do referrals under them. And then just internally um, from Service Source. Um, so I actually remember. Um, pre-ABLE. I was doing benefit counseling before ABLE was passed. Mm -hmm. And honestly, as a benefits counselor, when it finally went through, we all rejoiced yeah. because finally we had a solution to a problem that was always continuing. Um, and ABLE really solved uh, that problem for us. So uh, ABLE fits in. Yeah. Um, I pretty much talked to I talk about ABLE with everyone I work with, um, participants, service or staff, <laughs> people we employ, because it does really fit into a lot of um, the benefits counseling piece. So, so I'm curious, when, when you're talking with people about ABLE, um, how do you sort of blend in, you know, like when do you blend it in and mm -hmm. how do you suggest to people that they use their account and how do you sort of introduce it? Sure. So um, I think uh, you said a, a lot of what I'm going to repeat, but um, someone doesn't have to have be working to have ABLE. But as a benefits counselor, the people I see do tend to be um, people who are working, planning for work. Um, I get a lot of, oh, now I have a job offer. Can you help me? What's this going to look like? Um, calls. Um, so uh, also, as, as Ken was mentioning, our HR refers people over. So as the referrals come for our new hires, um, people are making a lot of decisions about life when they start a job. So we start looking at um, the wages, the, um, the wages, the benefits they're getting, and then what the job is offering also in terms of benefits. So... Um, ABLE typically comes into the discussion about the time you're talking about the benefits and the benefit income limits and resource limits. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so ABLE helps, as you mentioned, provide a 
um, solution to that resource limit. So uh, for people with those means-based benefits and resources um, are really anything that can be turned into cash to be paid for food and shelter. So when you're looking at resources, it can be cash, it can be money saved in the bank account, it can be retirement accounts, stocks, land, life insurance, really anything that can be cashed out and turned into cash, just pay for things, um, you know, SSI, supplemental security income, Medicaid, Medicaid waiver, SNAP, are going to look into. And so ABLE comes as we're talking about these benefits people are getting as a solution because, you know, service source, a lot of these ability one positions, we're paying a very good wage. People want to save money. Um, and this is an option for them so that they can um, have savings and not get into trouble. <laughs> um, really, it, it really provides that solution. Um, yeah. Another thing we do uh, look at, especially as with the service source referrals internally, is kind of comparing. Um, service source does offer that retirement 403B account, but also ABLE. And they can do both or they, you know, depending on their benefits, they may need to choose which route they want to take. So, um, you know, ABLE doesn't offer that employer match like the retirement accounts do, but um, it does have uh, places you can save money into, you know, varied savings accounts or investing in growth portfolios. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've brought up my state's ABLE account website and shown people, well, here's where you can invest. It's not just a savings account. You know, depending on your risk tolerance, you can put it in the market. Um, I, I do bring up the ABLE account um, website a lot during our meetings. Um, talking great. about um, also ABLE and tracking spending with those qualified disability expenses. Mm -hmm. um, but really, what it really boils down to when I'm working with people is really looking at those resource limits and talking about the savings, and this isn't a good option for saving. No, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you said something that really sort of piqued my interest. You're, you know, mm -hmm. you were talking about, you know, the good jobs through Service Source. So in your experience, how can ABLE accounts, you know, support employment or, you know, employment-related goals? Sure. Um, ABLE accounts, um, as you mentioned in your, in your intro, can be spent on qualified disability-related expenses, um, as, which is very, very broad. Um, I like to give credit to that, how broad that is. But um, as far as employment goes, it can be the transportation to and from work. A lot of people are taking... Um, specialized transportation for people with disabilities. It's a fair amount more expensive um, or Uber or things like that that are more costly. Um, you can spend it on employment training or support. If somebody needs job support, um, they can use their ABLE account to fund that. Assistive technology, uh, if it's not being provided by uh, the employer or VR, uh, it's definitely easily something that can help support employment and um, success, um, healthcare expenses, you know, when you start looking at employment, you also realize there is a whole person and maybe, maybe healthcare expenses don't really relate to employment, but they do because you need to be healthy and, and uh, get the medications and the therapies that, that they need. Um, uh, cell phone bills, another thing that doesn't necessarily say this is employment related, but honestly, we all need a cell phone to be able to okay. um, talk to employer, uh, supervisor, those kinds of things. Um, the other thing is, is uh, like we mentioned, I've seen ABLE accounts being used to save for retirement uh, as, that, as that option that helps support employment and employment related goals. Excellent. Um, so can you share, you know, uh, is, is there been like one particular success story around ABLE employment that really jumps out for you? Sure. So I worked with somebody, I'm going to call him Arnold. It's not his real name, obviously. Um, and I just worked with Arnold last month. Uh, he was referred to me for benefit counseling services from our vocational rehab. 
Uh, he accepted a position actually as service source, job coach at service source, helped him look for work, was able to get him a job at service source, um, and he's going to be a mail clerk or a general clerk at the Department of Transportation. Uh, he was referred to me, which is kind of convenient. Well, he had a job offer, but he was awaiting his government clearance, which is my favorite time to talk to people um, because you really can look at all the nitty gritties. Um, so I met with Arnold and Arnold wanted his parents to join because they help him with his financial decisions. So I met with Arnold and his family. And the first thing we did was assess his work earnings. So we looked at what's the pay rate, um, how many hours was this job offer? And it came out that he was gonna be earning around $1,400 a month. Um, you know, 17 some dollars an hour, 20 hours a week. And so around 1400 is what his earnings were gonna be. Uh, the next thing we did is we assessed what Arnold's benefits were. Um, Arnold was getting the supplemental security income and he was on his mom's health insurance. So um, after we assessed those things, I asked the family kind of what their goals are for Arnold and what Arnold's goals are. And one of the things they mentioned is, um, at this point, this is a new job and they wanted him to be able to stay open with social security. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't mind if the check wasn't coming, but they wanted that backup plan because this was his first job. So mm -hmm. he had it worked in a very long time. They weren't sure physically, you know, with his disability, if he was gonna be able to maintain it. Um, and they just wanted to make sure they had that backup plan as they were making this transition. Um, the other thing they mentioned is they wanted um, to be able to save for future expenses. Mm -hmm. um, a lot about what you're talking about, you know, um, it's not just retirement, but all the, you know, what, what happens uh, during a pandemic, what happens during a yeah. national disaster or if a car breaks down or something. So just allowing uh, Arnold to save for his future. Based on that, um, I did make the suggestion to apply for the ABLE account. Um, we looked, Arnold was 27, is 27. He's still with us. <laughs> Arnold is 27. And, um, but he has an intellectual disability. So his disability started before age 26. He was already on social security. So he really already met the two criteria to get the ABLE account. Um, we looked at the, we actually looked at this and you it's great you mentioned it, at the ABLE National Resource Center website to compare state plans. Um, they wanted to know where they could invest the money and the different portfolios. So I pulled up the website and we looked at Virginia and DC and Maryland and um, I sent all that off to them to compare um, different plans. They picked a plan um, and they planned that once he starts working to do an auto transfer monthly. So his bank, you know, his paycheck's going to get deposited into his personal bank account and each month they're going to put have an auto transfer into able to help him save for his future um so the outcomes for arnold was he's able to work he's able to maintain eligibility for social security income ssi or supplemental security income through social security and he was able to open an able account to save for his uh future that's great uh, able to work and save. We should have a, a webinar about that. Um, <laughs> so that's you know, and, and not only that. I mean, I, I I love that story and thank you for it. But it it's also like the first time he gets to watch his money grow, right? Yeah. And boy, there's nothing like that to really you know ignite an interest in you know money management and financial capability, uh, especially in young people. You know, being having the opportunity to be able to watch that money grow, um, boy, there's nothing like it. Um, that's a great example. Thank you. Um, gosh, I'm going to stay on time. I have one final question for both you, uh, Missy and Ken, but I'm going to start with Missy. So um, given your experience uh, in the ABLE space, what, um, what would you tell our audience uh, that you know you you've learned that you didn't know when you started. What's the one piece of advice that you would share? Um, I would I would say the guides on the National Resource Center have been very valuable. Um, like I talked about the the guides to help compare states, um, the other decision making guides that are on there have been uh, really great uh, uh, 
uh, <laughs> really great to share with family so that they can make um, decisions. Um, I would say also um, service source, we, we have this in-house, this benefit counseling piece, and it's great that I'm able to do this and uh, our team's able to do this. But if um, somebody out there, you know, isn't connected to a benefit counselor, there are uh, free state programs called WIPA, Work Incentive Planning and Assistive Programs, that can help connect people. Um, ABLE is a piece of a very large um, picture for people, and everybody's picture is pretty unique. And so getting that one-on-one -on -one benefit counseling, um, it, I maybe because I'm a benefits counselor, but I highly recommend um, connecting to the your state's WIPA just so you can refer either your clients or uh, if you need it yourself. And lastly, I would say having the support of senior management, having Ken support this, um, it really makes it easier for me on the ground to be able to provide these services to people. So having the upper management um, involved helps support the mission. That's great, thank you. Ken, I'll ask you the same question. Um, what advice or first steps would um, would you give to to the audience that you wish you had known uh, about Able before you know before you got started? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I'd say what I wish we had back in 2014 is the wealth of resources, right? That Missy just just stepped through. I mean, all, your your team has really done a fantastic job, Tom, in compiling information through the ABLE National Resource Center, um, we do leverage those. I would encourage everyone who's thinking about ABLE accounts, this, you know, maybe this is new to folks, um, you know, use those resources that are out there to help educate people. I do think Missy's suggestion of getting um, engaged with the state in which folks reside as a starting point to at least understand what their ABLE accounts offer uh, they, they have information on their own state websites to help provide, you know, kind of a roadmap as to how to get started with ABLE accounts as an individual, as a family member, as someone who just wants to help support an individual with savings. Uh, and I do think there's also differences between the state programs. And so there may be some consideration in working with a benefits counselor or through the National Resource Center. That, that maybe there's a consideration of looking at some of those stronger state programs, which just have evolved over time. Um, and so I think all of that leads to a place now where when we started this process back in 2014, when this was all approved, things have really, I just think, continued to improve and the options are greater. Um, there's tremendous knowledge and support that can help folks who are serving people uh, with decision-making and it, it's, it's really all about that, right? We wanna help support uh, the people we serve uh, with the full array of options, with all the information that's available so that they can make educated decisions on how best to save and also protect those important um, you know, benefits and resources that they rely so heavily on. So I guess that would be my suggestion is to just um, you know, get involved. They're great, they're, they are great and powerful tools, ABLE accounts. And uh, I would encourage folks to, to, to pursue them, get smart on them, and, and help support the people that we all serve. Oh, great. Thank you. That's, that's great. And thanks. Well, first of all, thanks to both of you for being here today and talking about your, your ABLE journey. Um, but even more importantly, thanks for what you do every day for folks with disabilities who are you know, getting jobs and building financial futures. Um, you know, I know that's what what service source is all about. That's what NDI is all about. And, you know, as, as we said, when we started, you know, we are, we're, I know we have a long way to go, but um, we're at the highest rate of disability employment in the history of the country. And it's because of folks like you and, and programs like oh this. So, so thank you. It's um, really a privilege to be working with you. And same here, Tom. I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. And, th and, and for those of you who don't know, big shout out to the ABLE NRC team. Um, Marlene and Lori and Cheyenne do an amazing job. And Miranda Kennedy um, has, uh, boy, you think I'm passionate about ABLE accounts? <laughs> These guys have just done a great job. So, so please check out the resources. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those as we move forward as well. Um, so thank you again. Um, uh, Kara, let's move to the next slide. So opportunities to share information. So we broke this down in a couple of different ways. So obviously there's a lot of employers here. 
Um, you know, there are some ways that you can provide some of the ABLE information that both Ken and Missy talked about, um, that I talked about. Um, you know, when when things are when information is provided to the entire workforce annually. Um, you know, if there's an employee resource group, disability related employee resource group, we get a lot of traction around ABLE um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, obviously, sometimes there are people with disabilities in the employee resource group, but sometimes it's a parent or sometimes it's a sibling. And, you know, they they never heard of ABLE accounts before. Or, you know, quite often, sometimes it's a person with a hidden disability who maybe has not even disclosed their disability yet. So that's a great place to, um, to talk about ABLE as well. Um, part of the onboarding process, letting folks know about ABLE accounts, again, really powerful savings tool. Um, you know, up to $17,000 a year, tax advantaged. Um, you know, that's, that's a, and you could tap it for disability related expenses. Um, anytime an employee might contact HR um, for, you know, asking for assistance, changing or choosing an option. Um, but also we wanna make sure that we have, we did some thinking about for service providers as well. So again, as Missy said, obviously a great place to bring up ABLE accounts um, during any benefit counseling opportunities uh, with folks. Uh, during a periodic wellness check or making sure that an employee is progressing uh, without problems toward their career goals. Um, anytime there might be a check at some sort of transition point. <clears throat> so maybe a promotion, <clears throat> increased hours, something like that. Another great time to mention ABLE accounts. If somebody's getting a promotion or their earnings are going to be going up, you know, maybe uh, they'd be able to better uh, contribute to an ABLE account. Obviously, regular savings to retirement accounts. And um, also, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when encouraging people to file income taxes, one of the things that we, uh, we know here at NDI is that there are a number of people with disabilities who um, may not um, have a filing requirement, but could benefit from filing their taxes uh, for the earned income tax credit. So lots of opportunities to be able to um, mention ABLE accounts uh, for folks with disabilities. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Here are a few changes or some options that an employer could offer. Um, the option to open an ABLE account, we have that here at NDI. Um, the opportunity to make a contribution to that ABLE account, that would be you know, taxable income to the person with the disability, but it could go straight into their ABLE account and start earning interest or uh, earnings over time. Um, allow uh, a certain portion of wages to be directed uh, every uh, pay period to the ABLE account. Um, Ken, I think you talked about that, both you and Missy talked about that. Um, and obviously the option to offer benefits counseling to employees to make sure that they're supported in the choices that they make. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, ABLE resources, um, we've got you covered on this. Um, let's go to the ABLE success slide, Karen. So um, one of the things that uh, we, these are uh, uh, photographs of our ABLE ambassadors. This is just a, a small sampling of them. But ABLE amb uh, ambassadors are folks with disabilities or family members who have ABLE accounts who have really shared their success stories. So we have folks, uh, you know, that have bought vehicles, uh, power wheelchairs. We even have folks who have bought um, homes with their ABLE account. And it's really, um, check these out, it's really uh, inspirational and exciting to see how people have used ABLE accounts to improve their lives in the way, you know, in, in the ways that are important to them. Um, you know, maybe it's home ownership, maybe it's an access, it's a really cool accessible van. Uh, but, you know, folks with disabilities get to pick what's important to them and save toward that goal. Um, let's go to the next slide, ABLE Decision Guide Series. Uh, as, as we've talked about the whole presentation, we have all sorts of ABLE Decision Guides to help you through various parts of the ABLE process. They go step by step, and they have multiple, um, uh, multiple uh, pathways to various outcomes. So it can really help people uh, make better decisions that really work for them. So are am I able eligible selecting an ABLE account, <laughs> excuse me, 
understanding ABLE accounts and public benefits. That's one of the more popular ones. Managing an ABLE account, finding funds to save in an ABLE account. That's really important as well. Um, dis discovering whether something is a qualified disability expense. Lots of uh, different uh, ABLE um, decision guides that uh, folks have access to. Let's go to the next slide. Again, our website is ABLE National Resource Center or ablenrc.org. Uh, uh, so again, we have decision guides there. We have uh, more information about the ABLE program and a lot of those comparison tools uh, that I and Missy were talking about earlier. Um, lots of FAQs. So there are FAQs for ABLE account owners. There are ABLE uh, FAQs for family members. Uh, we even have podcasts around ABLE webinars. And again, as Cheyenne mentioned, this webinar will be uh, archived and put up on the website. Um, we also have a newsletter. So please, 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 everyone sign up for our ABLE newsletter. It's our achievable newsletter. Uh, you can sign up for that on the website. We also have toolkits. Um, so we have a service provider toolkit, um, uh, uh, employer toolkit, um, and also an outreach uh, to, uh, an outreach toolkit uh, to communities of color. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is a one-page uh, flyer on ABLE and ABLE NRC. And through the magic of technology, there is a QR code, hopefully, on your screen right now. If you just hold your phone up to that, it'll take you to um, that ABLE NRC uh, flyer. Um, so it's a way that you can download it to your device um, so that you can, let's go to the next slide, help spread the word about ABLE. Um, you know, <laughs> taking a step back, we've, we've heard from Ken and Missy about how ABLE accounts have, you know, impacted uh, people's lives. At ABLE NRC, you know, we've seen um, through our ABLE ambassadors and through countless stories how, you know, being able to save has helped people with disabilities be more financially resilient, um, build assets, uh, you know, build a better financial future. So at ABLE NRC, you can connect with us um, through uh, social media. You can sign up for our newsletter. Um, I would be remiss, let's go to the next slide, if I didn't mention uh, joining us uh, Thursday for part two of Ready and Able to Save, part two. It's from Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, we're offering basically a technical assistance office hour where uh, everyone um, uh, who spoke today will be there. Also, our ABLE experts from ABLE NRC, including Marlene and Lori. So any uh, it's an opportunity for employers and service providers uh, who participated in this to um, you know, ask any questions that you may have. Uh, please make sure that you're registered for part two. Um, we really hope to see you there on Thursday. Um, let's go to the next slide, and I'd really love to bring in um, Kate and Kim and Ken and Missy. Um, I want to I want to thank uh, Able NRC for inviting me to be part of this today. Thank our funders, Prudential and J.P. Morgan Chase. But most of all, um, Kim, Kate, Ken, Missy, thank you so much um, for being here today. But also. Again, <laughs> thank you for what you do. Um, because of you guys, every day, we are changing the lives of people with disabilities. Um, hope to see all of you Thursday. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. And thank you for all you do. Um, without all 500 of you doing what you do, the employment number wouldn't look like it does today. Um, please make sure that you know your work is important. Your work is critical and your work is changing the lives of folks with disabilities. Thank you for being here today. It's been a pleasure.